and in the middle of that tour, in the middle of the winter, I had a, applied for a special duty assignment. And so I got called to go interview for it. And that's when I went to interview for the U2 program. When you went to interview uh, or you applied, you had not flown, right, for at least a year or so because you were in Alaska? Yeah. So what right. what was that interview like walking in going, I haven't flown anything, you know, and I've, I've got to do this. I didn't say that. I, <laughs> didn't, I didn't tell them that. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. Matter of fact, after I'd flown two sorties and they, they accepted me on the second sortie, I, I did very well. And, and today they don't do that because there used to be a kind of a uh, hard feelings for somebody who got accepted on the third sortie versus somebody who got accepted on the second sortie. So today they fly everybody three sorties uh, okay. to avoid, to avoid that. But back then they went, okay, I flew with uh, snake Pearson and flew two sorties with him. The, the light went on about halfway through the first mission uh, on because the U-2 is a strange airplane. Uh, it's really weird. And I used to tell everybody, it's it's the ghost guys with the weird synapses in their bodies that can fly U-2s. It doesn't mean you're a, a better pilot to fly a U-2 versus – it's just some people get it. That particular airplane has some real idiosyncrasies. You and I both know if you fly an airplane and as you're coming down final and as you get closer to the runway where you say, okay, I'm going to pull the throttle off here. Boom. And, you know, one potato, two potato, touchdown. You know, it's just a certain cadence. You know that. And in the U-2, as you cross the threshold and you pull the throttle to idle, and it's one potato, two potatoes, three potatoes, four potatoes, five potatoes, six potatoes, seven potatoes, eight potatoes, nine, kill a touchdown. And it just goes on for so long that a lot of guys are just ready in that standard thing. They've been flying other airplanes and they want to let it down. Well, if you let a U-2 touch down to where the U-2 has a main gear in the front and a little tailwheel. And as you cross the threshold, two knots above the stall speed, the tailwheel is really high and you get into ground effect. Now, ground effect is, you can feel ground effect in a U-2 at wingspan. Normally, uh, Aerodynamically, definitions of ground effect is occurs at half the span of a wing. In other words, 100 foot wing, you can start feeling it at somewhere around 50 feet. Well, in the U 2, it actually can be felt earlier than that, but most aircraft you can't. So you get into that. So now the airplane's, because of ground effect, is going to fly well below its stall speed. So as the airplane starts to slow down and the angle of attack, the airplane is no longer climbing or diving but it's just slowing down. The airplane is now slowing. And so the wing is increasing its angle of attack in order to stay there. And so if you look at the fuselage while this is happening, the tailwheel starts two feet above the main gear and eventually gets to about two feet to two and a half feet below the main gear when it finally stalls and down it falls. And that'll keep it on board. If you were to touch a U2 down, while the tailwheel is slightly above level or, or higher, then the main gear touches, the tailwheel goes down because the inertia of descending, the whole yeah. aircraft goes down like that. Well, you just increase the angle of attack, and now it's at flying airspeed in ground effect with a higher angle of attack, so it leaps off the runway, and it bounces off the runway. Oh, and now you're yeah. at five feet, and now the airspeed, because you just did that, is starting to decrease more rapidly than it did earlier where you were just slowly transitioning. So now you have to unload the airplane to get it back down to one to two feet main gear and start to pull back on it. Or from five feet or higher, it'll fall and actually hurt the airplane. It's a very lightweight airplane. Wow. And the first two C models they built were after they had had people who, because the U-2s originally had no two-seaters. Mm -hmm. And... They would teach people how to fly by giving them T-33 flights and then flying a U-3, which is a, a 310, uh, in the pattern with them to make sure that they were right. But, but the actual landing 
Nobody can actually be in there except for the mobile controller in a high-speed vehicle on, with radio to try and help give you inputs. But several of them landed too hard. The main gear goes up, punches through the sump tanks that are right above that, and now the airplane catches on fire. And so they were able to rebuild a couple of the airplanes that they put the fire out that was occurring right behind the cockpit and eventually said, you know, instead of just rebuilding this airplane, we could put a second cockpit in there for you. And now you have a two-seater version. So they built a two-seater version where what was used to, what was used to be the Q bay or the equipment bay where the cameras were kept. Now they put a cockpit and molded a canopy higher than the front one. So you're sitting up like this. So the back seater sees, this looks like a nose. The top of the canopy looks like a nose to you in another airplane. And so you could use that to help train people. And that helped enormously with the, the training evolution of people learning how to fly the U-2. But the whole point of, of doing all this is that it's a different airplane. Meanwhile, while you're doing this, while you're, while you're trying to hold the airplane in that attitude, the wings are out here, the fuel is in the wings, and there's very little baffling, if no baffling, in the tanks at all. So if you let a wing go down one or two degrees, the fuel starts to move from this wing where the fuel's level, so let's go like this. This fuel starts to run to the root. This fuel starts to run to the, to the tip. So now, aerodynamically, you have to put in some aileron to try and bring the wing back up. And if you don't get it back up in a hurry, then the fuel keeps running and it gets more and more and more to where you have to put in full control. And so as the Jeez. stick is coming back, that's one of the reasons why the U-2 doesn't have a stick, but it has a yoke. It's because... When the yoke is nearly full aft, sometimes you have to put in full aileron control. And because anatomically, the way we're built, we kind of come together in a V. And when the stick is full aft, you don't have full control in a mechanical stick left or right when it's wow. sucked into your gut. But if it's sucked against your chest or just barely full, you can have with one hand on it, able to go 135 to 150 degrees with the yoke back around again you, you actually rotated your hand on the yoke to where it was gripping like this so it was like grabbing a th those old balls that people would put on 57 chevys to, to turn the steering wheel like that and so you would do like this the double coming in and out because you couldn't stay long because if you went like this put full aileron in well you didn't want it to switch to the other side and some of the other really weird things about the u2 is these this nose gear and tail wheel is like a bicycle. Hmm. And so if you think bicycle, so you're going to take a little jump off a ramp on a bicycle. If you jump off a ramp on a bicycle and you maintain the front wheel and the back wheel in line with each other, you know, think of a motocross as the guy's up in the air, he comes down. If he lands, the wheels going straight, he continues to ride. But if he was to yaw and turn sideways, as soon as he touches down and the wheels bite a little bit, well, he's going to want to fall over because his inertia is trying to take him in that direction. And, and now it's going to be, yeah. and that's the same thing happens. If you land in a yaw, it causes a wing to go down, just like it would in a bicycle. If you were to touch down jumping a bicycle with a yaw in it. And so the wing, it, so we always had to land with the nose and tail wheel aligned as much as possible. So if in the crosswind, you had to do a little bit of wing low. You couldn't land in a crab. You had to yeah. do wing low for it as you're coming in, which becomes problem problematic because of the fuel. If you had a lot of fuel, that wouldn't be a good solution. So it's a it's a it's a real. It had all of the problems of 1940s, 50s airplanes rolled into one. And God, yeah. it was, it's, it's still, although the newer aircraft, which is now instead of only having an 80 foot wingspan, has 104, 105 foot wingspan. And it has two tanks in the wing. It has a main fuel tank and it's got two outboard tanks. It still has some of the same problems. Um, but the older U-2, which had 
for the longest time the same engine in it that the newer U2 had. Not, not, not talking about the S, but I'm talking about the R. <clears throat> so we liked it because it was really the sports car. Um, mm-hmm. It literally was an 11,000 pound airplane with no no ordnance, no fuel, no ordnance, no fuel, no equipment in it, with a 17,000 pound thrust engine. So, you know, th- that's a pretty impressive. Yeah. That's why the airplane yeah. climbs the way it does. Then, but but now you can load the thing up with, for instance, the R model or the S model carries the same amount of fuel that an F4 did with three tanks on board. In other words, about 18,000 pounds of fuel. Uh, but what's amazing about the current U2 is while it's taxiing around on the ground, sitting in idle, just taxiing around on the ground, its fuel flow is higher than it will be when it's cruising at altitude. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. So when you get it up to altitude and you're cruising and you've got the throttle, the throttle is pretty far forward. But if you measure the fuel flow against what the fuel flow was when you're sitting on the ground, where you got a lot of air, it's sucking in and burning. It's less than that. So that's why the airplane is so efficient, is it grows a long ways when it's up to altitude, cruising along at its speed. Because when it flies up at altitude, it's flying at that same speed that I was talking about before, between 100 and 115 knots, where it's just it's just the heart of its envelope. At least that was for the for the old uh, C model. And the R model is pretty much the same thing in that in that regime, but move it down a little bit because it's got a bigger wing, so it can go a little bit slower at altitude uh, and still go along. But it now instead of having in, it, instead of having about five hundred and fifty to six hundred square foot of wing, it has a thousand foot square foot of wing. So that's it's a uh, it, it's a, that's one of the benefits of the U two over some of the um, unmanned vehicles is because even though some of the other unmanned vehicles can get up to near the same altitude as U2, they don't quite get as high, but they don't take as much equipment up there either. The the current U2 carries somewhere over 3,000 to 5,000 pounds of wow. equipment on board to altitude, which is a, an ama- amazing payload. Uh, the others are like a tenth of that, 500 pounds. I, I, I'm not 100% sure on all of that, but I know it's a lot less. So the the it, it interview process, um, I know some of it, they actually keep close guard. They don't like to talk about it, but was it to a couple flights in the U-2 just to see how you would handle it? And did you, well, what was it like wearing the pressure suit the first time? It was a, a little different, but, you know, I've been wearing helmets and oxygen masks and, I mean, I think I was more um, concerned the first time I suited up to go fly in a T-37, uh, you know, because now you, you, you're getting ready to go fly and they want you to be very finesseful with your feet on the rudders and stuff. And you put on these great big boots, you know, coming from Louisiana, we wore pretty lightweight shoes if you had shoes on at all. Uh, so you're wearing boots, <laughs> then you're, you're putting on... Um, you're putting on uh, uh, all sorts of stuff over the top of you, wearing a parachute, uh, maybe LPUs, depending on where you were flying, uh, an oxygen mask and coming up like this and uh, later on in 38, a G suit and putting a lot of things on you. The very first time you put all of that on, you're going, how can I be finesseful when I can't even walk around in the squadron bay without yeah. feeling like I'm going to fall over. And the the pressure suit was was similar. Um, I didn't have a problem with claustrophobia, but I do remember one of the guys I was going through, through F4, excuse me, U2 school with at the time, uh, we would, a lot of times we would have high altitude sorties and for the navigators, they would plan out one sortie and then duplicate it and take us off a half an hour apart from each other. So we'd end up flying around, following each other. And the navs only had to plan because they would give you these big map boards that they draw by hand individually each time. Ooh. And so it's just Ooh. a lot less work for them if it's just one <clears throat> one route instead of coming up with new coordinates, new turn points, and all sorts of stuff. And I remember talking to him. Uh, his name was Dave. And he said, boy, 
we were talking back and forth at high altitude on a squadron frequency. And he's saying, boy, I'm, I'm having a tough time here. I'm, you know, he, I think he was actually thinking about bailing out because uh, he Jeez. was getting really claustrophobic. I think oh, they yeah. now do a better job of it. I don't, at then, I don't think they quite ran you through the ringer as, as hard to make sure that you could deal with the, the pressure suit. Uh, because there were things that you had to learn how to do uh, in a pressure suit. Because if, like we're doing right now, if I'm talking on the radio, I've got my mic in front of me like this, and I'm just talking. As I'm talking, I'm fogging up the faceplate. I have to learn when I breathe out to actually point my breath down. Because if you wow. don't point it down and you breathe, it's no fun when all of a sudden, well, you know, if you were a glasses wearer and you put glasses on and you put one of our masks on for COVID and it fogs up your eyes, you, you can you can either pull the glasses off or you can pull the mask down, but you can't open up your faceplate at altitude to get rid of that, at least not safely. And, right. um, and so you have to learn different things. And actually taking a suck of air in will clear your visor because the oxygen comes in on two little piccolo tubes on either side of your face and so they come in with a whole bunch of things so by taking a big deep, deep breath in it'll wash all the stuff off now there's a knob in the airplane that you can rotate because the face plate actually has little tiny wires in it uh so it's like the rear window of your car where you can turn on the defroster Defrost, yeah but the problem with that is if you turn it up high and it clears it all off if you forget about it an hour later you're starting to have problems because it has evaporated all the moisture off your eyes oh. and so now your eyes start to get really dried out and just turning it down doesn't solve that you have to you have to you know it takes takes a couple more hours before your eyes get uh, lubricated again you can't open up and squirt visine in each eye yeah so, like, what if you got an touching, itch touching the t well itches you just have to learn to deal with i mean <laughs> there are ways it, there's a, a little food probe in the side of the thing that you could stick in and kind of get it around you could adjust the microphone some of them have adjustments on the microphone where you can move it around so you can move it out and up maybe get there but most of the time you just wow. went all right itch and just go uh just Think of it something is. else. Yeah. Think of something else. You know, it, you're not, you're not going to get there. It's not going to happen. Flying in a pressure suit, it actually becomes very comfortable after a while. Does I've got, really? uh, I've got, oh, I don't know, probably 2,000 hours of pressure suit time, just guessing. And uh, uh, you can get into that to where uh, it becomes, okay, I'm used to this now, and I can deal with it. It, it's not encumbering. I mean, you can kind of squawk at a few things. I used to have problems with one of the gloves to where the finger was a little too long. And I, and the, the you know, I talked about how maintenance works to airplanes. Well, the physiological support unit that supports the pressure suits and stuff is another unit that we would never fly either the U2 or the SR without having. And these are the same white garbed people you see around the astronauts helping strap them in and stuff. Well, I was complaining about that. Well, they just took and re the the glove finger to take up the distance to where the wow. next time I yeah. went, the end of the thing was at the end of my finger. And it wasn't just a big, you know, like your sock having gone to the toe of your foot and you can't do anything about it. That's what this was like. And, uh, and it was making it awkward to push buttons or to do anything dexterous with the gloves. They just fixed it right up, kind of kind of customized it, even though it was supposed to be size large or a size seven or a size eight they, they made oh that finger is a little long that finger is a little short they would they would do things like that and uh wow. those people just your lives are in their hands the whole time because if that thing doesn't work sure the pressure suits the pressurization of the airplane is supposed to work but if it doesn't work that pressure suit is your lifesaver and if it doesn't work you're dead ejection seat aircraft yes same ejection seat in the U-2 as what was in the SR. Both Lockheed-generated, Lockheed-designed ejection seats. The only difference between the U-2 and the SR was that in the U-2, I could actually fire through the canopy if I had to, but the, the canopy, the overhead in the SR was 
titanium. And you don't want firing through that. If you did that, you would just be kind of squished. Could you eject at altitude, like at the mission altitude that you were flying? I mean, was that a possibility? Yes. yes. And it has been done. Really? And lived through. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Um, so what was like, how long were you flying these things? Were really long missions? I mean, would you take off out Which, of Beale and the U-2? The, the, the U-2? Yeah. Um, out of Beale, uh, they, they started you walking and then running uh, before you were sprinting. And so you would uh, first fly some sorties in the two-seater. Uh, after the interview, you come back. Now you start off training. But now instead of in the interview, you actually fly in the back. Uh, all of the switches to operate the airplane are in the front. And the back is kind of like uh, an instructor. He's got a lot of things, but he doesn't have everything going on. So you do the interviews in the back seat. Then now you're going to get trained on how all oh, the generators are here and this is how they work. And this also, you learn what, how all of that's supposed to work. And then they start off, well, let's make sure that you can land the airplane comfortably and that sort of thing. So you do uh, some low altitude in the pattern work and some air work on uh, approach to stalls and and other things to maneuver an airplane and then we get into a pressure suit and we go fly high and uh learn how the airplane is and get a chance to wow look at the world out here you you get exposed to that in longer and longer missions the first one's maybe two two and a half hours long and then a little bit longer um for instance my very first op sortie was a 10.3, cool. you, know, you know, I was flying and, and they called me and say, how are you doing? Cause we have a, on, when we go to ops, we're fully checked out, but there's always an instructor pilot around to try and it, it's kind of like you're fully checked out pilot, but you're number two and you got a flight lead who's, who's mm -hmm. with you. Now flight lead in our case is somebody who's on a radio uh, to, to help you out a little bit. And I said, I'm doing fine, fine. He said, well, we're sure getting a lot of good data here, uh, so we're going to keep you up. And so that very first sortie, uh, I flew for 10.3 instead of the normal. Not, I was planning on a 9.2. The norm, normal mission was a 9.2. So they kept me airborne to the maximum of, of my crew rest, you know, the crew duty time, um, without having to go to higher headquarters and ask permission to exceed that wow. so uh so you 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 build up to it you know you i don't think any of us are born with a 10.5 butt you know to where you can fly around and and i've had some over 12 hours to where you know you that's a long time to be sitting in a pressure suit and the best you can do is slightly loosen the lap belt a little bit and put both hands on the consoles on either side kind of straighten up your arms and get your butt off, off the, 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 the seat for just a little bit. What was nice about the R model is its cockpit was really big, and you could run the seat full down, run the rudder pedals full out for a while. Then you could run the seat up higher, and then get your legs pointing down a little bit. So this, for me, who was about 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 I had a lot of room. There were a couple of 6'4", six 6'5", six guys that Ooh. they would have to run the seat full down. And then sometimes I think they were packed off to the side to keep their head in there. But uh, they flew the same sorties, but I, I know they had to have uh, had to have more trouble than I had. And the, and the guys who were only five foot six or so, five foot four, uh, like they, a they had a good time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like yeah. a house in there. Um, so this is the height. You're you're talking the 80s, right? So this is the height of the Cold War, Reagan yeah. era and stuff. I right. mean, was this? Right. Were you worried, like in the kind of the Gary Powers kind of scenario? I mean, was it kind of a in the back of your mind? Well, we didn't of... we didn't overfly hostile places. Uh, you know, we we flew along the Korean DMZ, but we stayed um, stayed a little distance away from the DMZ, not terribly far. Uh, yeah. On our, quote, photo missions, we would push right up to it, and we knew exactly where we were. We would hope the bad guys knew we were staying on our side and mm. fly there in uh, in Europe. We would fly around the uh, uh, the Iron Curtain, you know, sorties around that. The airplane is a peripheral 
looking into other right. country kind of uh, across the border. What what can I see over there? You right. know, from from above seventy thousand feet, the 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 electronic horizons a long way, the visual horizons pretty good distance. I, it's always kind of nice thinking that here I am at whatever altitude I'm at, and that and I'm looking around and I can see the horizon this way and horizon that way, like <clears throat> being airborne over San Diego, and you can you can see the the bay, the San Francisco Bay, um, and knowing that in this airplane. I could glide to anything I can see. So, so how long did you fly the U two? You said fifteen years, and, and did you take well, a break to the, go to the SR seventy one? Yeah, I flew for about four years in the U two, mm -hmm. and then I flew for about four years in the SR seventy one while I Beale, and then wow. I then I flew uh, three years in the U two slash TR one. You know, they they had used a different pot of money to build a bunch of airplanes in the station in the UK. And for political purposes, they decided to call them a different name because U2 has a, um, has an awkward name from some of its past history and not everybody country necessarily wants to have U2 flying from its borders. When they're talking to other people, there's some political application so they decided to call it the tactical reconnaissance number one uh tr1 aircraft but essentially it was exactly the same airplane with one wire bundle different that they've been it was missing from the tr1 and they added it in later in about 92 i think it was uh, one of the air force generals decided that who are we fooling and decided to rename them all uh u2s and so gotcha. all the aircraft that, that were built in the 80s to the to 90, it was when they re... You know, the U-2s uh, manufacturing actually ran three different periods. They built them <clears throat> from 54 to about 56. I, I don't know exactly the date, but they, the first batch of them was built then uh, in the mid-50s, let's just say. Then they just redesigned the airplane and had gone through a lot of different shred numbers, you know, B, C, D, so on, and finally said, okay, we're just going to totally revise this. And whether it's revised for that or as one of the older guys who was in charge of the program at one point said, well, it was R for Robert McNamara, but they called it the U2R or the U2 revised. And yeah. so it was a definitely different airplane. It's It was almost identical to the difference between an F-102 and an F-106, you look up in the sky and you, and if they're flying wingtip to wingtip, you can tell the difference. But if you look at one individually over the other, you couldn't. So the U-2R was 40% bigger, but it looked almost identical. It takes uh, it takes the right angle to look at it to be able to tell, is that an R or is that, is that a C? And uh, it's used the same engine though. Uh, so So that worked out pretty well. Thank you.